Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andre Sapir. I'm a senior fellow at uh, Bruegel. I'm delighted to uh, welcome our speakers and the audience to this session on the future of Africa-EU uh, relations. Last year, the European Commission put forward a new comprehensive strategy for EU-Africa relations, which I believe constitutes a, a useful starting point for our discussion this uh, afternoon. Uh, the strategy contains lots of interesting ideas and proposals, uh, in particular, and not surprising, in the field of human development, health, vaccines, obviously, but also uh, education and, and other uh, uh, domains of human development, which I'm sure uh, the commissioner will want to, uh, to elaborate upon. Uh, some critiques, uh, however, have claimed that the EU's purpose with this strategy is not so much development per se as containment, in a sense, geopolitical containment containment of the expansion of China and of Islamists in Africa, and containment of migration flows from uh, Africa uh, to the EU. So is the new EU strategy a development strategy or a containment strategy, or perhaps it's both? This is the question that I would like to pose first to uh, the first speaker, who will be Ms. Uh, Jutta Urpilanen, the EU Commissioner for International Partnerships, who is res also responsible for development policy within the uh, European Commission. I will then turn to all other speakers to hear their views on the EU strategy and whether they think it is the right one for Africa uh, at this uh, juncture. Ms. Vera Songwe, the UN Under Secretary General, who is the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa, which is headquartered in Addis Abeba, and Mr. Masoud Ahmed, the President of the Center for Global Development, the think tank headquartered in Washington, with whom Bruegel is partnering in the organization of this uh, session. Uh, I should indicate that, unfortunately, Minister Hutt from Senegal, who was also due to participate, had to cancel last night due to a conflict in his agenda, having a, a cabinet meeting uh, in Senegal uh, right uh, at this very, very time. After the interventions by our three panelists, there will be an opportunity for a question, a, a question and answer session, uh, during which I will take some questions from the audience. To, put, to pose your questions, you should use the Slido application and enter the code BAM21AFRICA in one word, BAM, B-A-M, Bruegel uh, Annual Meeting, BAM21AFRICA. Uh, so without any further ado, let me turn to Commissioner Upilanen and ask her to respond to my question about the EU strategy for Africa. Is it a development strategy, a containment strategy, or is it a bit of both? Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And dear friends, I'm so delighted to participate in the Bruegel annual meeting at the beginning of the new political session. The discussion on the current state of play and the future Africa relations is very timely. And to your question, I would say that the new strategy we, uh, we launched is partnership strategy. Because uh, four years have passed since our last African Union, European Union summit in Abidjan, and few months separate us from the next one in 2022, delayed because of the pandemic. But as you said, just days before the pandemic was declared in March 2020, the EU published the communication towards a comprehensive strategy with Africa. And we proposed renewed EU-Africa relations to meet the challenges 
of the future. Council conclusions in June and October 2020 confirmed the proposed way forward. We have engaged in intense discussions with several interlocutors. The partnership with Africa laid out in the communication and in the Africa protocol of the post Cotonou agreement are today more relevant than ever. The EU wants to craft together with the African continent a future that is digital and green, offering sustainable job and growth opportunities, and it needs good governance, peace, security, and should provide opportunities for regulated mobility and migration. Human development, as you said, is its key cornerstone. So what shall we do then? First, we need to talk green. The majority of the African population will remain rural until the 2040s and climate change aggravates food insecurity. Across the continent, 2050 million Africans suffer from hunger and the situation, unfortunately, is worsening. Secondly, we need to talk digital. Today, half of Sub-Saharan Africa's population does not have access to energy, and this is likely to worsen due to the pandemic. Investing in a green and digital transition is the way to achieve a sustainable recovery and generate opportunities for Africa's growing uh, workforce. Sub-Saharan Africa's economy contracted by almost two points in 2020. And it has been the world's slowest growing economic region in 2021. Africa's recovery and the global recovery are intertwined. So we will succeed or we will fail together. With the Global Recovery Initiative, launched by the European Commission, we emphasize the link between investment, debt relief, and achieving the sustainable development goals. And this is key for Africa. We need more investments and implementing the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement helps attract it. One tool to bring new investment into countries in Africa is the European Fund for Sustainable Development. We make an impact acting together as Team Europe and as international community. The French-led summit for financing African economies, the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative, and the Common Framework for Debt Resolution, those all are important examples of this. The forthcoming African Union European Union Summit in early 2022 is a crucial milestone to renew the partnership between our continents. So let me now delve into human development. Human development was central to our Africa strategy. The pandemic pushed it even more to the forefront. Resilience, growth and sustainable development rely on human development and human capital. Investing in people, in particular in youth and women, is critical to building a stronger partnership. And this is a high ranking priority for me. In July, we pledged 700 million euros to the Global Partnership for Education 
to help transform education systems for more than one billion girls and boys. I personally decided to increase the funding for education to 10% in regions under my responsibility. And we will surpass that target. Under our 2021 till 2027 programming, education now is a priority in 39 country strategies in Sub-Saharan Africa. We will prioritize the quality of education and teachers training, access to education for girls, skills for work and vocational training. We want to help new generations in Africa access more and better job opportunities. This is why we launched the Invest in Young Businesses in Africa Team Europe initiative. A second critical dimension of human development is, of course, health. As Team Europe, we mobilized 8 billion euros for Africa as part of our global COVID response. We then invested in equitable access to vaccines via COVAX. Now we are working hand in hand with African countries, EU member states, financial institutions and the private sector to advance vaccine and medicines manufacturing capacity in Africa. This is the only right long-term solution. Our 1 billion euro initiative on manufacturing and access to vaccines, medicines and health technologies in Africa at the G20 Global Health Summit in May created momentum. Work is advancing, for example, in Senegal, where Team Europe is supporting Senegal's ambition to become a regional hub for vaccines production. I am also encouraged by the agreement reached by the Pfizer, BioNTech and South Africa's BioVac Institute to manufacture around 100 million doses a year of COVID-19 vaccines for use by the African Union, as well as the advanced discussions between Senegal, Rwanda and BioNTech on future vaccines production. The cooperation between the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control and the African one is an example of what partnership is in practice. So, dear friends, the pandemic has exposed our fragilities. It has also pushed the global community to craft collective solutions and developed effective partnerships. Our Africa-EU partnership can be an important part of the solution. We have an opportunity to further strengthen it at the upcoming summit. It should become the booster for the green and digital transitions, and it should bolster the ongoing efforts to produce vaccines for Africa and in Africa. I look forward to debating with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I think you addressed uh, very well the, uh, the questions and you, you did fill in uh, quite a few of the, uh, of the blanks uh, that, I, that I left and you, I think you explained very well the, uh, the, uh, the strategy and what are the upcoming uh, challenges at the, uh, at the, at the summit in uh, early 2022. So let me turn now to uh, Ms. Sangwe, as I said, who is the uh, executive director of the Economic Commission for Africa. And uh, you, Ms. Sangwe, you, in a sense, you, you embody uh, all of the, or many of the features uh, that the commissioner just put forward as to Europe uh, is wishing to partner 
with, uh, with Africa in terms of women, in terms of education. Uh, you're a highly uh, educated uh, person. You have a fantastic uh, CV. Uh, you also have uh, lots of involvement with the private sector through uh, your work at the World Bank with the, with the EIFC. So I, I, I'm very, very uh, much looking forward to hear from you. Uh, what is your take uh, about uh, not only the view that uh, the commission has just put forward, but you know what what is contained in the EU strategy? How do you uh, how do you receive this? Uh, do you think that this strategy is up to the uh, to the challenge? Is it focusing on the on the right uh, issue? What is in a sense the the, the view from Africa? Uh, about uh, the strategy, you know, what is right, what is wrong, what is missing. Uh, I think this is really the chance to, uh, to put forward that view. Please, Ms. Songwei. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Mr. Sapir. I can call you Andre. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the same uh, panel, of course, with the commissioner. And uh, Masood, of course, uh, we have been going through this uh, crisis together. Um, and thanks for uh, you know, having the Economic Commission for Africa, the UN uh, at large uh, in this conversation because it has been an important element. Listen, we are two years into the COVID crisis and I want to start there a little bit and, 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 and maybe put this you know, EU Africa strategy in the context of a crisis that we are still on the going. And I think what one has seen is a series of sort of what, I will, what I'm now calling dynamic divergence, uh, which is essentially you know, the world going in different directions. So we've heard from uh, Uter about you know, all the nice things, you know, girls' education and health and climate change. And, 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 but, but I think what has happened essentially with COVID is a breakdown in all of those things. It's been you know, really two different pathways that we have uh, experienced. And let me start from the financing pathway. In the financing pathway, what we what we saw was a world that slowly Europe, you know, seven hundred and fifty six billion dollars given to sort of stand up the crisis in the beginning in the economic disaster. Uter has, you know, talked about the four point five percent GDP in Africa that we have lost. Um, I think from the very beginning of the pandemic, we thought Africa was going to suffer both from the health crisis but also from the economic crisis. It turned out that we had a lot more. Uh, penalties on the economic side. Our growth went down, unemployment went to almost, we have almost 100 million people that are un unemployed. And we at the Economic Commission for Africa, working with Masoud and many others, started calling for you know, injections of resources onto the continent to make sure that we can put a flaw on this crisis. That, the, that flaw never came for Africa. And I think that's one important point, which essentially, if we agree that we're going to have our development intertwined, and which I believe it is, then it's impossible to have a, a sort of totally divergent response to the crisis. One that says, you know, for Africa, we'll just go and help, you know, a handful of what we call low income countries. 75% of Africa today is middle income. 75% of Africa today actually is urban. You know, and so thinking we'll go help low income rural populations and solve the crisis does not work. And I think we do need to sit up and relook at that strategy. I think on the second point, and it's the COVID, uh, uh, the, the health pandemic and the response of that. And Uta, I beg to differ with you on this one, because yes, there was an $8.5 billion announcement. But when we look at the numbers, and this is on the COVAX, and there was a very quick, I believe the sentiment was correct. There was a quick reaction, a quick coming together of the world to say, let's create a facility and let's see how we can help Africa. But we created a facility that put all of Africa's health security in the hands of one industry and one firm in India uh, that was going to be able to deliver COVID vaccines, never able to give us uh, the herd immunity we needed at 60%. And, and, and there again, I think we see a little bit uh, uh, a shortfall in the COVAX delivery. And, and, and that came because immediately uh, uh, when the health pandemic hit, we had divergence in uh, uh, trade practices. Countries closed their borders, countries refused uh, uh, exports of you know, basic and important health material. And so essentially, again, we ended up in this space where Africa could not have access, first of all, to PPEs, 
But we worked and we put up, we set up what we call the African Medical Supplies Platform, the Economic Commission for Africa, Africa CDC, Africa Exim Bank, and our special envoy on health. And we were able to then get access to uh, PPEs. The same thing on the vaccines. I think we started talking about the vaccines. COVAX came, everybody was very excited. And a, a, a critical, critical lesson uh, uh, for us in the developing world today is really what we have learned out of COVAX. Again, divergent uh, a response, you know, the, the, the West overbought, oversupplied, over reserved vaccines. Today, we're talking about 55, 60% vaccinations in uh, the West. We are at 2.8% on the continent, 2.8%. So if we had $8.5 billion put together for vaccines, where are they? They have surely have not reached us. And, and, and so there is a problem there that we do need to acknowledge and say, the reason that it's happening is because the market forces are not working well. And I think there again, EU Africa partnership needs to sit around the table. And that's what we're trying to do with the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And it precisely the industrialization of Senegal and, 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 and South Africa and Rwanda, you know, can we produce more on the continent? But to do that, we need a different kind of procurement system. We need a different kind of governance system, not just in Africa, in Europe, in the United States, in China, everywhere else, to make sure that the procurement processes that we're working around are governance strong. And, and it's not just Africa's procurement processes that are weak. It's, it's a global weakness that we need to strengthen and ensure that we can create. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation that says Africa's health security cannot be run outside of Africa. Africa's health security must be run on the continent and we need to do that better. On the private sector, yes, there is a sort of a rush now to say we want to industrialize or we want to create African private sector and the health sector. But it's really again about are these countries getting the licenses or are, just, are they just doing tap and fill? Are we building that expertise that the commissioner spoke about or are we again just you know using them for the final sort of end of that process. And we believe that we need to do differently. We need to work on it in a way that says 85% of Africa's health commodities are imported from outside the continent, of which 50% come from Europe. With the crisis and a shutdown in those markets, we had no access. So in addition to talking about production, we need to talk about policy. We need to talk about leveling the playing field. And leveling the playing field means the Europeans the Americans need to open up their competitive spaces so that Africa can compete squarely in these spaces and not just, as you said, Andre, look at Africa as the space where we go to fight China and, 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 and ensure that whether China shows up or not. I think that in the, at least on the COVID space, we have not had too much of a Chinese conversation, right? Because the, the Sinopharm vaccine, at least the, the sort of production of that didn't go up. Morocco is using a lot of that, but most of the continent has not used it. We've depended on AstraZeneca. And with the AVAT initiative, we have 400 million doses coming from the United States. Uh, uh, so it is essentially a United States vaccine that will vaccinate 30% of the continent today. What we want, even from Johnson & Johnson, and we're saying, is that we need production capacity to go beyond just licensing. We need uh, a, a lot of the research to be also done on the continent as the commissioner has spoken about. So I think one of the things and we have to look at the COVID-19 crisis almost as a silver lining. It allows us maybe to look at the Euro-Africa conversation in a different space. We must objectively look at where did we make mistakes? Where have we not, where have we fallen short? And then honestly and objectively respond to those areas where we have fallen short. We have fallen short on financing. We have fallen short on the health response. We have fallen short on the governance side as well, collectively. And we need to now say, can we re-address some of those critical issues that are going to be needed? On climate change, I think we're working together. I think that there is a risk that, you know, we use, we say that, you know, we must have a green recovery out of this crisis. The Economic Commission for Africa has done some studies that show that if one does a green recovery, one could get 420% more jobs, one could get 320% more value added. But we do need a transition period to that green recovery. We do need to be able to continue to use our, say, for example, gas assets. You know, just like Germany is asking for 15 years to phase out of coal, Africa needs, you know, 30, 20 years to phase out of gas. And I think those conversations we have to have in a just, honest, and transparent way. The, the worry today is to say, 
you know, in the EU Africa conversation, if Africa doesn't go totally green, they will not get funding. We cannot do that. We will not be able to do that. We are already spending 11% of our GDP responding to climate change. We need to be able to then say, how do we find a way to get to that just transition in a way that allows us to industrialize, in a way that allows us to create jobs, in a way that allows us to respond to this COVID crisis without getting a sort of carrot and stick. If you don't do everything green, we don't finance you. And so I think there has to be a conversation where Team Europe, Team Africa sit together and say, how do we get to this end collectively together? And that what is the transition period? How do we manage that transition period so that the exit in 2050 is the right exit? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vera. I think that was a great uh, intervention. In a sense, uh, looking from my vantage point as a, as a trade, as a development uh, economist, as an international economist, uh, and before moving to, uh, to Masood, obviously, uh, I would just say I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to the discussion, to, in a sense, the rebuttal uh, by, uh, by the commissioner, because I think we have heard two very different viewpoints, and I think that's great for, for, the, uh, for the discussion. Uh, from the commissioner, we heard a, uh, um, a presentation or a strategy uh, that focuses on human development. From uh, Ms. Sangwe, we heard a strategy uh, that is putting the emphasis on industry, on manufacturing, uh, on looking forward not only in the capacity of Africa and beefing up the capacity of, of Africa in a whole series of sectors, uh, including obviously in vaccine, uh, because in a sense that was the, the, the start of the discussion, the pandemic and the response to the pandemic and uh, the uh, the industrial uh, production within uh, within Africa, but also indeed uh, looking forward to the digital and the green uh, transition that the Commission now always puts forward in all of its strategies, both domestic and international. This is also both for Europe, but, but for for Africa, this is also an industrial uh, strategy. So I think the the we have had rather different uh, approaches. Uh, to, to, to the situation, one putting more the emphasis on human development, the other one putting more the emphasis on industrial strategy, both by Africa, but also by the partners uh, of Africa, both uh, Europe, but also uh, other, other countries, including indeed uh, China. So bef before we enter, in a sense, in, in this debate uh, between, I think, two rather different uh, approaches, uh, let me now turn to uh, Masoud Ahmed. Um, he comes from, uh, from Washington. Uh, he looks to Europe and to, uh, to Africa and to the, the relationship from, from, a global, uh, from a global perspective with the huge uh, amount of, uh, of experience on, uh, on development in, in different parts of the world and on, on, global, uh, on global issues, on global governance with very good knowledge of Europe and, and of Africa. So, Masoud, let me turn to you, uh, in a sense, to, to shed your light. Uh, you know, how do, how do, you, how do you react uh, to what you have heard, uh, those, two, uh, those two approaches? Uh, you want to, to, to add a third way to look at this, or do you want to, to confront them and to, to give your comments? The, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, and uh, I'm, I'm privileged to be part of this conversation and also to, to be able to speak after listening to both uh, Commissioner Blinden and, and Vera, uh, Vera Songwe, because they have articulated so clearly both the strategy that the, uh, the EU and the Commission have put together and uh, the perception of, uh, and the reality of what has been happening over the last 18 months that Vera talked about. And let me just at this point, perhaps offer um, a couple of uh, points of context and, and one suggestion on the summit, because I do think that really that summit couldn't be more timely and, and more important. On context, you know, the last 18 months have been terrible, but they've been terrible for everyone. 
no matter where you lived in the world, pretty much, you had this shared sense of going through a, a, a unprecedented uh, crisis. But now I think the next 18 months, what we're going to see is two realities emerging. And that's something that will affect the context in which any strategy, including the EU-Africa partnership has to evolve. So in Europe, uh, this morning in the Financial Times, the headline was that the, uh, un, I think the highest level of inflation in Europe causes the ECB to start thinking about uh, pulling back stimulus, the same discussion in the US. So the economy is recovering. Normalization of monetary policy, which will mean an increase in interest rates is on the cards. It takes some time, it'll happen gradually, but it's going to happen. And the conversation is shifting to shaping the post COVID world with climate change being very central in that conversation. But in Africa, if you talk to African policymakers, 2022 is a continuation of the crisis that they are undergoing now. So vaccinations, how do you manage the trade-offs between vaccinating people or lockdowns and the economic consequences, all those things will continue to be you know, right front and center in the conversation going for in, in Africa, policymakers' uh, minds for the next year. And so when we talk about the recovery, for a lot of African policymakers, the recovery is about actually trying to heal the deep scars that this crisis has left on their economies, on their uh, manufacturing capacity, on their service sectors, and, and I think one of the important messages that I take away from that is that when we have that conversation at the summit and beyond, it is important to start with the recognition that there is this dephasing, if you like, we're no longer going through the same crisis. And, and so it's important to be able to recognize that and start from that reality. And, and I do worry about that. Second context point is, uh, you know, I mean, I don't work for any uh, international organization anymore, so I can be a little bit more direct in, in saying this, but, you know, the big hit of this crisis has been trust. And there really has been an erosion of trust, a sense of, I would have started by saying disappointment, but I think it's gone from disappointment to disillusionment. And I have met so many people over the last few months from Africa, from actually from other developing regions as well, who basically said, no, the world is different from what we thought it was. Really, the rich countries don't care about us. And there is this, I think we have to face up to that reality. There is a sense of disillusionment in the nature of the response, the fact, small things sometimes uh, have a big impact. You know, the fact that 10 million vaccines produced in South Africa were shipped to Europe at a time when there was nobody being vaccinated in Africa. I think that leaves a big scar in terms of the erosion of trust. So we have to reestablish trust. And that's always hard to do. But as uh, Christine Lagarde had a, had a nice saying at one point, you know, that... Uh, uh, confidence and trust arrive slowly, but they leave on a gallop. You know? uh, and and uh, I think that that's very much true. And But it's, it's the job we have to do, because without that trust, it's going to be very hard to have the kind of honest conversations that, that we're talking about. Um, let me just say one thing about uh, the strategy itself. I mean, obviously, 18 months ago is a long time, and, and the commission has adapted, and, and the focus on human development, on the health sector in particular, I think the commissioner talked about some of the additional investments in manufacturing of vaccines, which I think is, personally, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good, very good initiative. Um, but the missing thing in all this is, is really physical infrastructure. There really isn't much conversation about the fact African Development Bank says that we 
Africa needs between 130 to 170 billion dollars a year of, of infrastructure investment. And, and I, we need to have a conversation about that investment and about where it's going to get financed from. Um, the risk is that we, we cede that conversation to others uh, who are willing to finance that investment without the same kinds of concerns about making sure that it is sustainable, that it is going to be green. So I think Europe needs to be very much a part of the conversation on the investment that is required in infrastructure, in energy, and how to ensure that it is financed on appropriate terms, how to ensure that it is uh, done in the right way, uh, to be at that table rather than to sort of, you know, turn away from that conversation because we don't want to focus on it. And that's just a, a worry that I do have. Um, so for the summit, let me just end by saying, the, if we start from the premise that this is, crisis is going to be with us for another two or three years in Africa. And if we start from the premise that this is going to be require long-term solutions. What are the dimensions of which we need to think about? One, of course, is pandemic preparedness and response. We have a lot of ideas that have come from a number of panels, including a, a G20 sponsored panel, which uh, Bruegel and, and CGD actually were the technical secretariat. Vera was part of that panel. Um, there, there are other panels as well. They've all come up with the uh, similar suggestions, which need to be followed through. Second, finance. So we have good news on the SDRs that they have been uh, allocated, but really for Africa, the SDR allocation in and of itself is relatively small. For low-income countries as a whole, it's 20 billion. Uh, I think for uh, low-income countries in Africa, it's even less, obviously, and even including middle-income countries in Africa. So the conversation has shifted to how can you reallocate some of the SDRs from countries that don't need it to uh, countries that do need that finance? And that conversation, I think, needs to continue in 2022, and Europe needs to be very much part of that conversation. Third discussion is the point that, uh, Jutta, you, you raised yourself, which is uh, human uh, mobi labor mobility and migration. And I think here, there are very interesting things that you're already exploring in terms of uh, global skills partnerships, ways to actually have temporary mobility, but the fundamental narrative change that commission has to really be the forefront of leading is to convert this from a discussion of a threat to a discussion of a shared opportunity, because Europe is going to be seeing a, a demographic transition. It's gonna happen regardless, right? So. And, and Africa is the opportunity in a way for finding mutually profitable ways of doing this. And the final thing I would say is, you know, fragile states and security issues continue to be a concern for a lot of people in Africa, uh, in, in the Sahel particularly, but not only in the Sahel, right? So, uh, and I think it's important that uh, there is a, reassurance that this is a long-term partnership. And for obvious reasons, after what's been happening in Afghanistan over the last few weeks, the question is uppermost in a lot of people's minds in Africa, you know, saying, well, are we going to, is this the future for us? And, and I think it's important, again, this summit is an opportunity to reinforce that. So I guess my plea to, to, to both of you, because in a way you are the decision makers, you know, we, we, we who think and think tanks, we can only write and, and, and offer ideas, but is, is to seize the opportunity of this summit to reinforce, to recognize as Vera said that there were shortcomings in the last 18 months. There were also good things that were done, but to say, look, for the next decade, if we're going to be together on these dossiers, the, each of these is a long-term sustained engagement we're in, and the ways in which Europe can partner are both direct, but also by the role it plays in the shaping the actions of the international 
development machinery and the international system, the organization. I mean, the Europe is the is the largest shareholder collectively of the World Bank of the of the IMF and 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 can play a role in shaping their actions also. So I would just end with this plea to say, please, if you can, let's use this summit as a way of not just taking stock, but also moving forward on the kinds of uh, longer term uh, partnerships that, that are going to be essential for both continents. So let, let's stop with that, uh, Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Masoud, and thanks for this uh, great internationalist uh, discussion, which I uh, fully fully share. Uh, you used uh, on several occasions the word trust, and uh, I think I think that is uh, that is obviously a key word. In the sense, trust and partnership. Uh, that it's it's two facets, right, of the uh, of the same uh, of the same issue. So real partnership is built on, on trust and trust, uh, you're right, I mean, trust within our societies uh, and trust at the international level, trust has been eroded uh, through, the, uh, through the pandemic as uh, it had been 10 years ago through the financial crisis, right? So those crises, uh, that's why they, are, they, 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 they leave scars. Uh, because they do erode trust, and as, as you rightly said, uh, quoting uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, it's difficult to build trust, and uh, it's easy to to lose uh, trust. So it's it's a, it's a hard uh, slug to uh, you know to 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 regain it. So on this issue of of trust slash partnership, and drawing also not just on the discussion that we have, but also on the questions that I'm seeing on, on Slido, uh, I would like to put to, uh, to the commissioner and to, uh, and, and to, and to Vera, uh, in a sense, the, the, same, uh, the same questions around this theme of, of trust and, uh, and partnership. And looking ahead, yes, sure, we are still in the pandemic, and there's still a lot to do. And I think Vera was very right, you know, when she used uh, the term dynamic divergence uh, on economic terms, but also on, on, the, uh, on the vaccination issue. So I think, yes, this is, this is certainly a priority uh, for the coming months, uh, maybe even for uh, coming years, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, so that's one conversation that we can have. Uh, partnership slash trust around the issue of uh, of vaccine of vaccinations of vaccines. Uh, the second one, I think that we cannot escape, and, and that I think all of you have, have mentioned, is the climate issue. Uh, in a sense, uh, the pandemic uh, could be seen also as a rehearsal for an even bigger global uh, issue than the, uh, than the pandemic, but of the same nature, which is the climate. And uh, if the uh, assessment of the handling, the, the international handling uh, by the global community of the pandemic is one where trust has been eroded, where does that leave us? at the global level, but in particular for this conversation in the relationship between Africa and, and Europe for tackling uh, the climate issue. Uh, because without partnership uh, of one form or the other, without trust, uh, if there is a vision in Africa, which is completely different from the vision that we have in, in Europe about, the, uh, about the, the, the climate matter, and also because we are at different levels of income, uh, very much so. So, you know, we have a completely different uh, approach to this issue. We, we are never going to, uh, we are never going to solve it. So I don't want the, 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 the discussion in the last 15 minutes that, that we have to, to talk only in a sense about the relatively short term, what I hope to be at least short, which is the pandemic, but also to extrapolate from the pandemic issue to, to the climate. Uh, 
uh, which has all kind of uh, which has all kind of dimensions. I, I'm I'm very I'm very eager to hear uh, from uh, both the uh, the commissioner and from the executive director from from the two sides. You know how do they see? I mean, if you know we had to have a conversation in uh, at the next summit where climate will be one of the issues. Uh, what are the what are the two visions and what can be a shared vision around around trust? How do we build trust, knowing that we come from extremely different uh, different situations, different accumulated obviously emissions in in the past, different income levels, many many different uh, issues. So uh, I start with you uh, again, uh, Miss uh, Opilainen. Um, what is your take? Thank you very much, and, and there are several points and issues uh, I would like to comment, but um, I start uh, with trust, because as a politician, uh, I fully agree with you that that's the key element of our societies. And when I'm, I have had several, you know, discussions and uh, uh, dialogues with the African partners and, and leaders, I can tell you that I'm able to feel trust, but also respect in those conversations and uh, exchange of views. And I think the reason for that is that um, even though uh, always the main priority and the main uh, responsibility of the national political leaders is take care and focus on their own citizen. That's the focus, that's the priority number one, even though that's the fact. From the beginning of the crisis, we decided not only look into a, uh, inside of the European Union borders and our own citizens, but also show our responsibility and solidarity to our partners and our partner countries. And that's why in the beginning of the crisis in spring 2020, we created this uh, global response package which was over 40 billion euros, through which we were able to help our partners, also in Africa, to fight COVID-19 crisis. We were able to provide funding, for instance, to uh, humanitarian assistance and, and humanitarian activities, but also we were able to strengthen the healthcare systems in our uh, partner countries in Africa. And then we also tried to help our partner countries to mitigate the social economic consequences of the crisis, which is huge a challenge still in, 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 in many, many countries. So this was immediate response we took. And of course, like Vera was saying, then the other tool and the other step was this uh, creation of COVAX facility. Because we Europeans, instead of making this kind of bilateral donations and bilateral uh, agreements, we wanted to support multilateral uh, cooperation. So we decided to create this uh, COVAX facility and through that then provide vaccines uh, also to Africa and our partner countries. I, I just checked the facts uh, through COVAX. We have been able to deliver um, a little bit over 200 million doses uh, to over 140 countries. Uh, and that's definitely not enough. So we need to do more when it comes to vaccines. And, and that's why I'm, I'm delighted that our partner countries, uh, sorry, our member states and the poli political leaders of, of the European Union are now committed to share 200 million doses by the uh, end of this year. So this is the political commitment. And of course, most of the, those doses are hopefully uh, uh, go, to, go to Africa. Then uh, I would say when it comes to this manufacturing initiative, I, I fully agree with Vera. It has to be this kind of 360 degree approach. So not only focusing on this uh, you know, uh, manufacturing, but also look at the regulatory aspects and also educational aspects, because we know that we also need to have, you know, staff who are, are, are really educated and they have a different kind of sports. So that's why uh, the initiative we are now working on is uh, and, and working with is, is, is this kind of a comprehensive approach 
uh, we have committed to use 1 billion euros to that, and we are working very closely also with those African uh, countries I, I previously mentioned. Um, then my, my, my third point is that, um, and this was something Masood actually raised, um, uh, and Ahmed raised, uh, and, and that was uh, infrastructure and investments, and particularly uh, climate-related uh, uh, and green in investments. Um, I personally hope that uh, the summit in the beginning of, of, of next year could be this kind of a uh, Team Europe, uh, Team Africa gathering, where we could also uh, concretely adopt a specific in, uh, investment package for Africa. This is my, my personal wish. And um, what we are concretely doing at the moment is that uh, because we are in the beginning of, beginning of the new financial cycle in the EU, uh, we are programming our funding. So we are directing our cooperation funding to the different continents, countries, regions, and different policy priorities. When it comes to Africa, we are going to spend or direct 30, 30 billion euros to Africa uh, for the next seven years. And 30% of the funding is uh, earmarked or, or committed to climate related investments and, and projects. So this is the high priority to us. Of course, I personally, and I was talking a lot about the human development, I see uh, also a connection between uh, these two. We are spending around 20% of our funding to human development uh, projects, but 30% is, is to climate related projects and, and programs. So that's the priority number, number one. And my final point relates to trust. I see that if we really want to strengthen the, the trust within the societies, which is my, uh, of course, my, my uh, objective, then we also need to include much more young people to be part of the society. Because 60% of the citizens of Africa are under 25 years old. The great majority of the citizens are young people. So that's why we are putting a special attention to young people so that they really feel that they are part of the society. They have access to education, but also access to 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 uh, to labor market and get a job. So I think uh, this is actually, from my perspective, uh, the main aspect of of trust, and this is why we are very much working on on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vera. Uh, back to back to you. No, thank you, thank you, thank you very much um, for that. And uh, you know, when Masood is there, he frames these things in a in a in a good way. Um, let, let me just start by saying, you know, again, and, and using some of the numbers that the commissioner has used, I think uh, at the beginning of the crisis, you know, when we all thought, you know, there was going to be this economic meltdown, uh, the G20 got together and, and, and sort of supported the initiative of the debt service suspension initiative, which has today altogether provided about $10 billion to the continent. Uh, and then we had the conversation on the SDRs. We did have $650 billion of SDRs equivalent released. Africa got $33.6 billion. And I think that is part of the trust conversation that we are having, right? If we, if, if, if and this is in addition, so, so, so the G7 countries got about $282 billion. Uh, so France got $31 billion. All of Africa, low income, middle income, high income, got $33.6 billion. And so the conversation around on lending, is a conversation that says, again, Africa doesn't want donations. We want to have a market rate for those resources. But you know, if we all go to, 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 to sort of the, 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 the marketplace and come up with 5% of the stimulus that is allowed to reinvigorate you know, our economies, then clearly this is not, you know, there is no trust building in that conversation. And I think we do need to look at it and say, how do we restructure the international financial environment so that yes, it's 30 billion, uh, but 30 billion over seven years. The G7 countries got $282 billion in six months. Are we really talking about a trust building conversation or are we talking about business as usual? And I think we do need to ask this question. When we talk about COVID and COVID vaccines, yeah, maybe COVAX has delivered 200 million vaccines to the rest of the world. 
but COVAX has delivered 30 million to Africa. So Africa has not seen 200 million. Africa has seen, at least as of last week, Wednesday, 30 million vaccines from COVAX, donations, maybe another 24 million. So, and, and we do need to split donations uh, uh, from procured COVAX vaccines, because now there is a little bit of a dose sharing, is dose sharing uh, the COVAX vaccines. And I think that's where, you know, we, we do need to have, when we speak to Africa, we do need to have clarity on what is it exactly that the program is delivering and how does it deliver it. We are actually a little bit worried today on the continent because if we start getting into booster doses, we may never get enough doses for the continent. And this is again, another place where that trust relationship could be tested if we're not careful. So we do you know, really welcome the discussions that happened in Europe last week on this. I believe that on the climate change part, there is maybe a, a better and faster meeting of the minds and maybe as we go towards COP26, we will be able to look at that. An area where there is so much, where we could build trust almost for free is on IT and, and you know, the whole digital space. There is a lot of innovation. There is a lot of partnerships, I believe, between uh, the Europeans and the young African innovative populations, which will be win-win. And maybe that is where we start. It doesn't require the $30 billion. It's probably in many spaces a lot easier to do that. And maybe as we redefine, I think we must relook at this EU Africa strategy in light of COVID, in light of everything else, the partnerships that we have had to see whether there are things that we can readjust to respond to the crisis. And that will be my sense is the beginning of a much stronger partnership, the beginning of a much better financial uh, system. But I, I, I stop there and say, I think the good news is that there is, I think, room to build stronger partnerships and room to build trust. But that will only happen after we acknowledge that there have been some weaknesses and we need to now strengthen the process going forward, working even you know, more closely together as we have been. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vera. So I would say, you know, Masood, I will, I will give you uh, one minute uh, to, uh, because we, we have only three more minutes uh, before closing this, uh, this session. Um, but I, I, I would like to, uh, to reiterate, in a sense, what was my initial reaction after I heard uh, the commissioner and then Vera in the, in the first round, uh, that there was a, an important uh, gap uh, in approaches uh, between the two. And I think that has been now reinforced, in a sense, uh, although all, you know, meaning well uh, and in the same direction, uh, I think uh, we are hearing that indeed from, uh, I don't know whether one can, uh, you know, Vera puts the mantle on Africa all on your, on your shoulders, but at least from a very important African voice, uh, no, no doubt, uh, we are hearing, in a sense, a plea, not just for acknowledgement that there are there are problems and that, that there have been problems in the last uh, in the last few months including erosion of, of trust but also for uh, upgrading or for modernizing the uh, the document uh, the strategy that had been put forward last year by the uh, by the commission and in a sense I think, uh, this means, uh, you know, from from the commission uh, viewpoint, uh, if one wants to to take this at heart, uh, it means that uh, you know one has really to reflect seriously. And I think this is also the gist of many of the comments that I've received on 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 Slido about questions, you know, about about the summit, uh, the upcoming summit. And many have asked, you know, what is the purpose of of the summit, and really what is going to be the concrete deliverables uh, that this summit can uh, can uh, can achieve you know is it going to be a milestone is it just going to be a conversation or is it going to be a milestone towards uh, correcting some of the of the shortcomings that we have observed through the pandemic and as i as i repeat uh, that are i think not very good omen for uh, the uh, perhaps even bigger issue which is the the climate one, uh, which is which has many features sort of linked to uh, to the uh, to the pandemic, 
again, global, uh, global issues requiring partnership and, and trust. So Masoud, um, I, I give you just one minute. We are already four o'clock, so we are already, you know, over time in a sense. So uh, I, I cannot give you more than, than a minute, but I, I think I want you um, to, um, to give a message uh, about, you know, the question that is posed to us by many people, you know, what could be center stage in terms of deliverables uh, for the uh, for the for the upcoming uh, EU Africa summit? What 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 would be your advice to uh, to the Commission? You know, how should they uh, modernize the strategy, and what should they focus upon? In one minute. So I'll give you my one minute worth, Andre, which is. The destinies of Africa and Europe are more intertwined than almost any other parts of the world for the next 1500 years. And Europe is also the largest player on the international development system, but it plays well below its weight because it tends to focus on what it does directly and not as much on how it shapes the global agenda in terms of how the whole world supports African leaders in moving ahead with their priorities. And I hope that this summit will be one where we can get Europe, both countries and coming together in the, in the commission, to really then also shape the international agenda to ad address many of the questions that Vera was raising, which you know, Europe cannot address directly, uh, the issues of market pricing on, on, and risks. And, uh, but Europe can help shape the international agenda in, in ways that will matter hugely for Africa. So I would just say, you know, there is a lot that can be done. There's a great possibility to use the summit for that, but it's a question of setting our ambition level at the level that is needed to meet the challenges for the next uh, decade that, that Europe and Africa share. There is no alternative to this shared destiny. Well, Masoud, you have given us uh, a way to assess the upcoming summit. In a sense, I think you have given food for, for, for thought. And uh, so have, as Vera, uh, Obviously, and you know, I think all of this is in in the laps of the, uh, if I may say so, of the uh, of the Commission and the Commission and and the European Union to to meet uh, the, the the challenge, which I think uh, is indeed. Uh, I mean, as you said, uh, Masoud, I think the partnership is inevitable, uh, is needed, um, but may need some rethinking. And uh, in that sense, I hope that this conversation has been has been useful, uh, has been useful to uh, to the to the two partners, to the European partners, and to to the African partners who have been able to have, I think, a very frank uh, exchange. And I think you, Masoud, have has contributed uh, hugely to uh, to helping this uh, this conversation. And um, I think we will have to come back uh, after the summits uh, to take stock. As what has been achieved? Uh, have we made progress towards uh, a better relationship? Are we regaining trust? Are we, uh, you know, taking taking stock of our shortcomings on on both uh, sides? Because as always in a partnership, when there are shortcomings, shortcomings are not one sided. They are from uh, from uh, from both sides. But then it's a question as to indeed. Uh, one is making to to build uh, for the uh, for the for the for the future. So I want to thank uh, our uh, our panelists. Uh, I want to thank our uh, our audience, and uh, I want to invite uh, everybody to um, reconnect with the uh, Bruegel uh, annual meeting uh, that is continuing uh, tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m. with a very very rich uh, program. So I look forward to uh, meeting many of you uh, again online for the continuation of, of conversation with Bruegel, with the global, uh, the Center for Global uh, Development. And again, thanking the, uh, the panelists, uh, the commissioner, uh, Vera and uh, Masoud. 
Thank you, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. Bye-bye.